But I want to start off by saying this the wonderful, wonderful news that I heard this morning that the, um, that the American... Uh, oh. This is really good news for you, not for me. <laughs> because what it shows is that anything is possible. <laughs> And so it extends hope for all of us. Um, hopefully I won't lose my clicker either. Allow me to begin to uh, undress. So I am going to talk about uh, entrepreneurship around the world and lessons that I've learned uh, by going around the world and meeting with entrepreneurs and studying entrepreneurs. But I want to start off with a question. I'm going to go over here because I think that you're being structurally uh, neglected because the podium's over there. So I'm going to compensate for that immediately by standing here for as long as I can at the beginning. Um, so I'd like to ask you, first of all, when you think about entrepreneurship, just to yourself for one second, who comes to mind as the examples of entrepreneurship that we're trying to create? Don't say anything, just think for one second who they are. And now, I'm not a magician, but I will predict the words that came into your head, or uh, the pictures, and they are these guys. Right? When you thought of who the entrepreneurs are that are making a difference in your world, you thought about Stephen Jobs, and you thought about Richard Branson, and you thought about Fred Smith, and you thought about Sergi and uh, the Google guys, and you thought about uh, Bezos and Meg Whitman, and so on and so forth. That's who you thought about. These are not going to change your world as a society. They're going to change our world as consumers, but they're not changing our world in terms of the quality of our lives as much as these guys. Now, possibly you'll recognize one person. Possibly you'll recognize one person over here. <laughs> possibly. Let me get out my very high-tech clicker here. <laughs> Possibly, but I'd be willing to bet that no one will recognize any of these individual people. Instead of Bryce. Who did you who do you recognize? I said that excluding Shane and Bryce. I said excluding. You're not you're already you're already not listening. <laughs> <laughs> ah, oh, ah, that's a very good point. <laughs> you think because you're an entrepreneur that you have an exemption from listening? <laughs> okay. These are the kinds of entrepreneurs who are, you who are entrepreneurs can be like, if you're not already, you may be already. And you who are policy makers or involved in influencing entrepreneurship can create. Not these. Forget about these. Forget about them. these guys. And I'm going to go into a few examples to show you what I'm talking about, and you'll see why. This is what I call normal people doing abnormal things. This is what I call accessible entrepreneurship. <coughs> these guys, dip, dip, when we use them as examples of entrepreneurship, actually diminish the amount of entrepreneurship that occurs in a society because they are unaccessible. They're impossible for us to achieve. They're level, levels of aspiration that do not apply to us. These represent levels of aspiration that, will apply, that do apply to us. So it's important for us to study and understand what these people represent. Some examples. In Mexico, 15 years ago, three graduates, young, fresh graduates from the Harvard Business School, set up a multi-screen cinema business in Mexico City in the midst of the economic just before. They had their timing was perfect. They did it just a few months before the currency was devalued by 50% overnight in Mexico. It was called the Mafia del Cin Cinemex. And they tried to solve a problem. The problem that they were solving is the problem of they called a brick and a stick. A brick and a stick means or meant that when you went to the cinema, like imagine yourselves here in the cinema, and you have to bring a brick and a stick. You have to bring a brick because there were no seats. You needed something to sit on, and you needed a stick to beat away the rats. <laughs> and in those days, the cinema experience 
It was government controlled, it was union controlled, the prices of tickets were very low because the government said everyone deserves to go and get to the cinema, so we're going to control the prices and make it low enough. And as a result, they were unpleasant, there was bad food, horrible quality, and bad movies. And they came in and said, we can create a new concept. The new concept is the multi-screen, I'm sure you have it here, and it's around the world, it started in the United States. Large, you can reserve tickets in advance, multi-screen, a lot of choice, very nice seats, good like these seats here, very nice quality, you get great food, great concessions, fast service, etc., etc. Cinemix. Two of the founders, one of them said, well, you can read it yourselves, we're taking the best practices from something, a model that's proven in the United States, works perfectly there, and we're bringing it to Mexico City. The only thing that we're changing, the only change we're making, instead of using butter for the popcorn, what do you use for popcorn here? What do you put on popcorn here? What, butter? Salt and pepper? Just salt. And pepper? <laughs> Just like that. There they put lime juice and chili, and chili sauce. Okay? That's, and they made a lot of money. They sold it 10 years later for $300 million to Lowe's Cinema. They made $30 million together themselves. They had 50% market share. They started exporting their concept to neighboring countries. And they created an entirely new experience to the consumer in Mexico City. I'm going to come back to this, ex to this example. I start with this example uh, intentionally, but I'm going to go now to the other side of the world, to Hong Kong. Well, it's not really Hong Kong, because I'm going to talk about a venture called Racing the Planet. Mary Gaddams, uh, Hong Kongese, set up uh, about six years ago, five or six years ago. Uh, and Racing the Planet is a very odd thing. Anybody here do marathons? Don't be shy. <laughs> this is your chance. If you didn't do it and you thought you did or it sounds good, you can raise your hand. I don't know. <laughs> How about anybody over here did a marathon? Nobody. That's why there were just... Uh, sorry, you've done... Uh, has anyone here... Uh, how many? Was it a 10K, 25K, 50K? You had your hand up? We'll come back. Sorry? 85K. 85K. That's fantastic. Anybody beat 85K? The hands go down. <laughs> What she stages in Racing the Planet are 250 kilometer ultra marathons in the worst places in the world to run marathons. In the Gobi Desert, they're all deserts. In the Gobi Desert, the Sahara Desert, the, Mon the Atacama Desert in Chile. And if you go through all three of those, you have the right to run in the coldest desert in the world. It turns out that Antarctic is a desert because there's no precipitation, they're very low. And so they run 250 kilometers in Antarctica. They don't do it all in one day, relax. They take seven days to do it. It's open to everybody. These are, it consists of competitive athletes and people who are 75 years old and 20 year olds that go and do it because it's there, because it's challenging. So here are just some pictures. And she's branded, it's called the Four Deserts. Called the Four Deserts. And what she's done with this is she created a store. Because there are only a few thousand people at most that can participate in these events. These are horrible events to organize. They're complicated. They're logistically very, um, very challenging because you have to put teams of people, 30 teams of people, out into the desert to arrange the course because you don't really want people wandering off and getting lost. These empty chairs may be because some of the people got lost. <laughs> but what she's really doing is creating a brand because she heard that Iron Man makes $150 million a year by licensing their name to a watch company. And she heard that North Face, anybody here have something called North Face? Yeah. Don't show hands, right? Doesn't, uh, lots of people, many more people, four people raised their hand about running marathons, but about 20 people raised their hands about North Face. Do you have any clue what North Face is? Do you have any clue what face they're talking about? Do you have any clue? Has anybody ever been there? Has anybody ever climbed it? No, of course not. That's the power of a brand. That you're all buying it because it gives you something that you don't have to climb the mountain for and risk your life in order to get. That's what Mary Gannis is trying to do and she's succeeding at it. We don't have results, that's the story yet, but without any equity dilution, the guys from Cinemex lost, gave up a large piece of their company in order to bring in investment. She hasn't brought any investment and a few years later, just through her own guts, has a $4 million company and she's just getting started. She's just getting started. She's increased the number of events, revamped everything, selling uh, products of all kinds 
that are branded Racing the Planet or certified by Racing the Planet brands. And she's got everybody, CNN, National Geographic, Discovery Channel, Time Magazine rated the number two in the world, etc. I do not get any commissions if you go and participate in these things, but if you want to, you can. It costs $3,000. Uh, and equipment costs, plane costs, and so on. By the way, she finances this. It's very clever. It's what's called customer financing. <clears throat> customer financing, she gets people because it's such an interesting event, so exotic, so unusual, that she gets people like us to pay six months in advance to sign up, $3,000. That means she has some beautiful little thing called negative working capital. I mean, she has excess cash and she has used that to run her business. Fantastic, isn't it? Third example. Sabbaths. I'm sure that no one here, I, I'm not sure 100%, I think that no one here has heard of Sabbaths. It's what's called an educational management organization, or otherwise EMO, managing where, where governments, certain governments, for example, in the United States, are starting to outsource the educational, the whole educational management experience to third parties. <coughs> for example, charters. Um, and this was built on a long time ago it started, built on a challenge of four myths, what they call myths. I'm not saying I agree with everything they say, but this is what they say. It's very clear. They say, first, well, we're challenging four myths. Education must be individualized. They say, no, it can be standardized. It should be nonprofit. No, it can't be nonprofit because it won't be sustainable if it's nonprofit. We're talking about public K-12 education. I'm not talking about other things. The more you invest, the better. They say, no, the less you invest, the better. In fact, you have to be efficient. You have to worry about efficiency in an education system. And learning by memory, memorization is bad? No. They break all the learning tasks of history, mathematics, <coughs> science, English, everything else. They break it into component learning points. And they teach the same thing over and over again in all their schools throughout the world. They have, why is Keystone there? I have no idea. <laughs> they have public schools in the United States. <coughs> They have private schools in the UK, Germany, Romania, the UAE, et cetera, et cetera. And they have public and private schools in those countries down there. Before telling you the results so far, this is just the map. Where do you think they're located? Where do you think they're run out of? Where are the headquarters of this company? I'll give you just one hint. I'll give you just one hint. They have now 75,000 students. They have, sorry, they have, sorry, 60 some thousand students. They have 75 schools. Where do you think they're managed out of? This I will give a prize for. Dubai. Egypt. Close. <laughs> India, far. Any other ideas? Dubai. Closer and closer. You guys. Well, you just take, you, oh, this is too easy. <laughs> this is too easy because what you're doing is you're taking the geographic yeah. epicenter. Yeah. You're averaging. <laughs> Next time I see you, I'm not, I'm not showing you this anymore. <laughs> They're located in a small, vi small village just north of Beirut. It's actually a suburb of Beirut called Adma. And they run there, there are a couple hundred people there running it. Some of them are programmers, some of them are management, some are marketing. It doesn't mean they don't have people elsewhere. And here are some of the results. They're running nine charter schools in the United States in inner cities, inner city charter schools they're running. The ones that have been running longest where they have data on have up to 100% every year, 100% college acceptance rates. In part because they define very clearly what their product is and who their customer is. They're a business. They say, we should run our business no differently than Toyota runs their business. We have a customer and we have a product. The customer is the college admissions officer in, on, in the universities. That's our customer. And our product is the improved minds and character of the children that come in at K and go out at 12. It's non-selective. You don't get selected on any basis except your willingness to learn. Okay, so something's working. And according to my ex, their, their goal is to get the five million students in the next eight years, nine years. That's a challenge. That's a challenge. And today, this is my estimate, because I squeezed out of Carl Bistani, the owner and the runner of this, I squeezed it out of him in public. I think they're making about a hundred million dollars a year. They're completely private. Okay, third example. Fourth example. Sure. Studium would like, by the way, I'm taking a break for just one second to talk to my judge over here. Uh, what my goal is about 20, 25 minutes on these examples and then 20 minutes on conclusions, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know who my stakeholders are. Yeah. Actually, 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 um, my goal is that, that they don't send me back. <laughs> 
given the beautiful weather that the mayor's arranged. <laughs> Studio Moderna, Slovenia. Anyone here ever been to Slovenia? Slovenia is a small place. Slovenia is actually smaller than Cape Town. Smaller than Cape Town. It's a country. And Sandy Chesco set up a company a long time ago, not too long, 15 years or so ago, that <clears throat> didn't start off to be a multi-channel retailer in, in, the, in Central and Eastern Europe, but became that. Starting with the crazy product to... Uh, anybody here a back... No, everyone here has back pain at some point. But he had a product which a friend of his came about 15 years ago and said, you should try this because it'll cure back problems. It's a little piece of plastic I should have brought with me. And you strap it onto your spine and it just sort of like sits there throughout the day. And Sandy said, that's crazy. This is a, this, this is a stupid idea. It'll never work. And he said, you know what? But I'm going to try it out. I took 10, he took 10 samples, gave it to friends with back pain. Within two weeks, they all, every single one of them called him up and said, I need another one because I want to give it to my friend. He said, I've got something. The way he decided to distribute this in Slovenia, and Slovenia is a, was a formerly Soviet-controlled country, not a former Soviet Union country, uh, but controlled, he decided to distribute this over the television. Television shopping. I assume you have television shopping here in South Africa? In the United States, anywhere, whenever I go to the gym and work out, you sit there and you see over and over again the vacuum cleaner that cleans everything. <laughs> up. You see the slicer and dicer and the beauty cream that make me beautiful and take all my pimples away and all that sort of thing. That's what they sell. He said it's called the, the, the technical fancy term for this is direct response TV, DRTV, or television shop. So I'm going to sell this over the television. Stupid product, stupid strategy. Why? Because in Slovenia, the people who sold things over the television, over television shopping, were ranked just somewhere in between fraudsters and criminals. <laughs> <laughs> if you sold a slicer and dicer over the television, that's a sign that A, it costs too much, B, when I buy it, it'll, it won't get shipped, C, if it gets shipped, when I get it, it won't work, and D, if it won't work, and I try to send it back, they'll say, I don't know, we never sold you one of those. <laughs> And he said, I'm going to do that anyway. And he, over the years, succeeded in doing it. Focusing exclusively on the markets in which television shopping was considered to be something in between fraudsters and criminals, specifically. And over time, built up a business that was multi-channel, not just direct response TV, also direct mail, also internet, also catalog shopping, had his own stores, top shop stores. Why? Because people, they said, I want to buy this, but before I buy it, I want to go see it. So they go into the store and see it, and I'm not going to pay you with my credit card. They go into the store, they see it, they touch it, and then they buy it. And he also has stores within stores, and several thousand of the major uh, large department stores there. Now, the third thing he did that was stupid, we had a stupid product, we had a stupid distribution stat strategy. The other thing that he did that was stupid was he said, I'm going to see how all these big companies in the United States have succeeded in doing it. This is in contrast to Cinemax, where they said, I'm copying lock, stock, and barrel. He said, I want to see how all the American companies are doing this, because it's a huge billion dollar business in the United States. I'm going to see how they're doing it, and I'm going to do exactly the opposite. <laughs> exactly the opposite. They outsource everything. They do the marketing can, they do provide the marketing concept and the financing, but they outsource the creation of the commercials, and they outsource the delivery, and they outsource the contact or call center, and they outsource actually the collection of the actual collection of money. They outsource everything. He says, I can't do that. For several reasons. First, we don't have all those third parties, and secondly, if they don't behave the way they're supposed to behave, I can't take them to court. The court system is corrupt, and even if it's not corrupt, it'll take years for me to enforce the contract. I'm controlling everything in-house. <clears throat> There's a problem with the air conditioning. We already know that. <laughs> And it says the center is currently working on it. Apologies for the inconvenience. Many thanks. Okay. So, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. That is important. Well, no, it is nice to know that somebody cares. Yes. It is nice to know. Uh, not to be taken for granted. Today, 
They're in 20 markets, 21 markets. They're number one in every single of their 21 markets. They make lots and lots of money. The numbers are there. They have 100 stores, 3,000 stores and stores. They did this all on their own capital, all on their own capital in an extremely challenged environment because all the environment, go back here, these are not necessarily nice places to do business. Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, Bosnia, etc. not to mention Serbia. Serbia. You know, these are challenging places to do business in. And, <laughs> oh, come on. This is going to be fun. You're a troublemaker. No, not just a little. Um, so, and he did not intentionally, and quite, quite intentionally, did not touch, and has not yet touched, Austria, Germany, Italy, Switzerland, etc., the contiguous countries. All of his motion from Slovenia has been, that's basically east, a little bit south, and a little bit north. All of them. Okay. They're big. They own the biggest private television channel in Russia right now, etc. And it did this all on their own nickel, all on their own buck until just uh, uh, the beginning of this year they raised some equity capital and they're already doing about 200 and they've grown like crazy can you imagine a business that in the, it's this economic environment has grown 30 percent a year organically by the way with no geographical expansion in the last three years they've been in their same countries in the same countries and have not acquired anybody okay fourth example a company called texas in brazil anybody here been to brazil a couple a few people I'm on purpose choosing examples that are far away and maybe a little in, in different and not American. In Sorocaba, a couple hours outside of San Paulo, a very interesting thing is happening. A company has grown up, they employ, I would say by now, 5,000 people, mostly in little in factories in that region, that makes, it's, the, it's one of the two leading manufacturers of the large blades for wind turbines and wind farms. You know how big these things are? Or did you know? These are, these are big, big. These are now 50, these are 34 meter long blades. It turns out they're the most important part of the wind turbine because they, they suffer the most stress. And these things are out there in the boondocks in, in wind farms. And if they crack or something happens to them, they, they're extremely expensive to go out and repair. And also, they have a bigger determinant on the efficiency of the whole system more than the controller and the motor and the rotor and all those other things. So these are important. They're one of the two largest independent manufacturers of these big blades in the world. And they're located in Brazil. These are the blades. In fact, most of their innovation has to do with the packing and storing of these huge things and how they get them on the ship. Um, and they're based, so here they are. Interesting about them. All of their raw materials, their critical raw materials, the resins, all of them come from North America and Europe, in particular Italy and so on. They all come from the northern Brazilians in the southern hemisphere. Uh, they all come from the northern hemisphere. And lo and behold, all of their customers are in the northern hemisphere as well. And this is not a low cost labor arbitrage situation. They are low cost, but it's not labor arbitrage. This is quality product and performance functionality. So something very unusual is happening here. They've grown by 10 with the ups and downs, and now they're suffering a down. I just found out because the market is for the market has stopped for wind turbines in the world, believe it or not, in most places. But they've got to be about a half a billion dollars revenues, nice healthy margins, thousands of turbines. No equity raise, all in debt, etc. A fifth example. This may be my last example, so you're lucky. <laughs> and this is a company called Octopus. I'm sure that no one, I almost imagine, unless you're in generic pharmaceuticals, you haven't heard of Octopus. Octopus is located in Iceland. It's a generic pharmaceutical company. Generic drugs, as you know, the drugs that go off patent. You take them, I think there's some generic manufacturers in South Africa as well, probably smaller ones. Uh, and they started out in 19, actually they started before that, but uh, in 1999, they were an insolvent, small, single product, 14 million euro, can't pay their salaries, company in Iceland, struggling, ready to close their doors. A young 29-year-old, Robert Westman, middle class, 
good businessman, knew nothing about generic pharmaceuticals, came from a, in a transportation company, uh, Icelandic, took over the company, and in 2007, they employed 11,000 people, were marketing in 40 countries, had $2 billion in sales, were worth about $3 billion in equity. They have a product portfolio of 650 products with another 400 in the pipeline. Nice, healthy EBITDA margins for anyone here who cares. And all this was based, this was not organic. This is 26 acquisitions. Here they had lots of equity capital, they had lots of debt capital. They had 26 acquisitions by now over 30. By the way, now they're number four in the world. Number 30, they did 30 <coughs> acquisitions and every single one of those international acquisitions, every single one of them was successful. That's unusual. Then they did it through leadership, through management, through team building, and through the belief that they can be big and have to be big. Ah, I have one more example. This I put in late last night, so there may be mistakes in it. Clutch Group, one of my students, 2006, graduated from the Harvard Business School, set up a legal process, this is in India, a legal process outsourcing company called Clutch Group, which has become number one in its field. Its goal, its goal is to become the Microsoft explicitly the Microsoft of legal process outsourcing. Avi Shaw's, from when he started the company at the age of 29, said, think big. Thinking small is not bad, it's a crime. <laughs> it's a crime to think small. It's a big industry and a big opportunity. You know, we in the United States, we're not very good at soccer. I don't know what happened no. yesterday, but I guess we must be very, by definition, we're now very good. But, but we are really good at lawsuits. We are really good. We have 77% of the entire legal spend in the world we have in the United States. That's a lot of money. The other 17%, or 15, sorry, 15%, I think, is in the UK and the rest of it, you probably, sorry to say, you're not very good at lawsuits, I don't think, because we've got it all. Um, and you had an, an un, at that time an, what is an unconventional idea, which was we're going to create an outsource company, but we're not going to take to India the cheap, repetitive, low-end jobs. That's not what we're going to outsource. We're going to create a system in which you have American and Indian lawyers, and we're going to do the high-end, but very labor-intensive high-end, like, you know what e-discovery is? Now when there's a lawsuit, you have to go out back in the emails and you have to go through them and make judgments about what, and it's millions and millions and millions of emails and email trails, documents that are electronic and so on, and so-called discover them, bring them into the legal process. Today, three years later, four years later, number one in the industry, recognized, about $50 million in revenues, four years later, $50 million in revenues, those are unofficial figures, raised a fair amount of money, and they have 300 lawyers in the United States, in the UK, and in Bangalore doing this work. Okay, and these are just other examples of companies that I've written about, published case studies on, when I was at the Harvard Business School. And this, this is the basis of these examples that I give you and these others, and a lot of research, the basis of what I call so what? What, are the, what do we learn about entrepreneurship from all of these things? So now I go into the second part. How are we doing? 15 more minutes? Because this is the punchline. I'm going to give you now I'm going to now give you my takeaways from these and other examples that I've run into. By the way, a way of, uh, I want to expand a little bit on my background just to say that in addition to the things that Mr. read about me, which are true, <laughs> except I'm still, I'm now at Columbia. I wasn't there before, I'm now I do a short course there. But um, I was a venture capitalist. Um, $75 million venture capital fund general partner. I was an angel, in, I still am an angel investor, been on boards of directors, et cetera, et cetera. And that's relevant to what I'm gonna say because it's all this experience together 
that I want to bring to the table. First of all, lessons about entrepreneurship. Number one, the manifestations of entrepreneurship, the ways in which entrepreneurship expresses itself, when you take into account the entire world, or as much of it as is possible, are infinite, infinite. There are as many different types of entrepreneurship, as many different kinds of business opportunities, as many different forms and shapes and varieties and sizes as there are colors in the rainbow. If you look, for example, at Mary Gannam's running races or <coughs> staging races all over the world in deserts, and you look at Robert Westman selling generic pharmaceuticals, that's just the beginning of the range that I'm talking about. Many of them are surprising. Many of them are not what we expect. We do not expect the ability to turn a grueling, unpleasant, blister-forming, <coughs> dangerous 250 million kilometer event into a huge brand. That surprises us. And when she's successful, which I think she will be, you will be surprised. Another entrepreneur has turned womb, worm poop, worm poop, into a very valuable fertilizer, selling it throughout the United States and now throughout the world. If you haven't seen, read the book, it's the best book on entrepreneurship ever been written, called Revolution in a Bottle, by Tom Zaki. How he dropped out of Princeton, took all of the garbage from the dormitories, brought in a bunch of worms, and, to, and learn how with a conveyor belt, a slow-moving conveyor belt, to collect all of their worm poop, liquefy it, and sell it for lots of money through Home Depot. <coughs> so their manifestations are many. Of those manifestations, many of them are perceived, I'll come back to this, as either worthless, impossible, or stupid. As an impossible example, I'll give you the only tech example that's here, that, that, that I will talk about, I think. A company called Given Imaging, have you heard of them? Some of you may not have heard of them, but you felt them. They invented the world's first voyage inside of the body. They produced a video pill that you swallow. It's a camera, it's a light source, it's a power source, and it's a radio. You swallow it. And it's the only way that you can reliably image the small intestine. It saves lives. It's been on the market now for six or seven years. A million procedures have been done. It had, when it went to market, 150 patents. That's in the impossible category. <laughs> it's now a commercial product. It's the standard of care. They invented a new field. It's called capsule endoscopy. G-I-V-N is the NASDAQ ticker stem. The so that, the implication of this, now for the policy side, I said I'd try and sort of sprinkle a few comments about policy. One of the implications of the fact that there are so many types of entrepreneurship that, it, that exist is that it is hard, if not impossible, for policymakers to predict what's going to be successful. So those of you who are trying to create the environment or the policies, it's impossible for you to know what's going to work and what isn't going to work. That's a big challenge. But one of the things it means is that it's probably a mistake to define priority sectors. Probably a good idea to be asectoral. I'll come back to that tomorrow and say a lot more about it. Second lesson or second takeaway. Entrepreneurship is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. I've been now to 40 countries. Most of them say we don't have enough entrepreneurship. A few of them say we don't have any entrepreneurship. When you dig in Saudi Arabia, where I've been several times, more than several times, where you dig in Saudi Arabia underneath the sand for the entrepreneurs, you find them. They're not prominent, they may be hidden. In Saudi Arabia, for example, some societies, in fact, try to hide their entrepreneurs, not intentionally. One entrepreneur who created a, in, in Saudi Arabia a very successful and prominent chain of chocolate stores called Anoush. Abdallah, Abdallah Al Munif is his name, young guy, quit his job at the bank, 
sold his apartment, went into rented a cheap apartment, got a secondhand car, and started running around trying to sell chocolate-covered dates. The first to corporate customers, one thing after another. He didn't tell his parents for three years that he resigned from his good job at the bank. Three years. He was 28 or 29 at the time. He didn't even try to look for a wife because he knew that any family that he would ask their daughter's hand in marriage would never even look at him. Now he's married, now he's got kids, now he's well, not, he's not that well, his stores are well known. It's everywhere in every society. I've never seen a society that has too much of it, but I've seen a lot of societies who say we don't have enough or don't have any. In fact, a lot of times the entrepreneurship in societies is channeled in antisocial ways, whether it's for tax evasion or worse. One of the greatest entrepreneurs in, was in Colombia, Colombia, where I've been many times, named Pablo Escobar. <laughs> Pablo Escobar was ranked by Forbes one year in the early 1990s as the seventh wealthiest person in the world. He had distribution channels. For those of you who don't know, he was a cocaine king in Medellin, Colombia. He had distribution channels throughout the United States. He knew logistics, throughout the world, including the United States, he knew logistics down pat. He was innovative and inventive. He figured, he had chemists working for him who figured out ways of mixing the cocaine inside of petroleum products so that it could be smuggled as tires, not in tires, as tires. When it got to its destination, he developed chemical processes for melting it down and extracting the cocaine out of it, back out of it, and selling it on the street. Can you imagine if that had been channeled in pro-social ways in somehow? Can you imagine? That's number two. Number three. Anyone can do it anytime. Anyone. Old, young. And I'm speaking um, right now from, guess which side of the spectrum I'm speaking from. <laughs> Regardless of color, rich or poor, poor healthy or sick. Name helps, but it's not critical. Having money helps, but it's not critical. I like to say that entrepreneurship is the biggest equal opportunity employer that there is. Because what matters, the biggest determinant of success in entrepreneurship, the biggest, is what goes on between your two ears. That's the biggest determinant of success. I have a student named Avi Kremer who became an entrepreneur the day that he contracted, that he knew he had contracted ALS, Lou Gehrig's Gehr disease, and knew he was going to die. And from that day on, he's created a huge nonprofit to look for treatments for ALS. And with me and with a couple of other people, we created a for-profit biotechnology company to look for treatments. We've already licensed our first treatment. He can't speak. He can't breathe. He can't eat. And he's an entrepreneur. I'll give you Google, Kremer, K-R-E-M-E-R, -E -E A-L-S. Having said that, if anybody can do it any time, and I will also say that all entrepreneurs, therefore, are created equal, not all entrepreneurship is created equal. I'll say more about that tomorrow, maybe in the Q&A. Not all entrepreneurship is created equal. Some of it is more beneficial to the individuals and to the societies than others. The high aspiration, high growth, continually dissatisfied entrepreneur is more valuable to society than the person who's looking for self-employment. That doesn't mean that that's not important. It means it's less valuable to society. And I know that's a controversial statement and a delicate one, but there's lots of evidence for it. Uh, by illustration, I'll give you a personal example. My grandfather, who came to the United States when he was two years old, he got a three, he got, a, he, grad, he, he left school in third grade. In third grade, that was his education. He became a wallpaper hanger and eventually had his own business selling paper hanging paint supplies in Philadelphia. 
he devoted everything he could to make sure that my father wouldn't have to do the same thing. He devoted everything he could to make sure that my father would go to school. My father ended up being a, initially a theoretical physicist as a result of that. By some aberration, I became an entrepreneur. I have four kids. Do I want them? I'd love to have them have PhDs in theoretical physics. I don't think it's in the cards. <laughs> but I would love for them to be entrepreneurs. In fact, two of them are on their way. The self-employment is a great way of putting food on the table. But it's not a great way of driving economic growth. I'm tight on time, but I'm going to give you just a few more as grist for the mill. Because it gets more controversial as we go along. Entrepreneurship and innovation are two different things. If you Google them, entrepreneurship and innovation, you get about 30 million hits in about 0 0.02 seconds. But they're two different things. Entrepreneurship is not innovation, and innovation is not entrepreneurship. Cinemex was not innovative, and it was very entrepreneurial. Putting lime juice instead of butter on popcorn is not what I would call a great innovation. Most of entrepreneurship, most of it, does not require innovation with a capital I. It requires small amounts of tweaking, of improvement. Most entrepreneurship. And there's a lot of innovation that's not very entrepreneurial. <laughs> Generic pharmaceuticals. Can you think of anything that is more anti-innovative? In fact, the drugs that they're copying are called innovatives in the industry. <laughs> and when they stop being innovatives, that's when they become generics. Does that mean that all the generic manufacturers are not entrepreneurs? No. Let's not confuse those two things. You do not need to be an expert in order to be an entrepreneur. Robert Westman knew nothing about pharmaceuticals. The guy who set up this video pill company knew nothing. He was not an engineer, he's a business person. Does anybody know the X Prize? Yeah. The X Prize. You know, just a few weeks ago, the, one of the prizes was given for cars. You know, anybody know about that? They gave a $5 million prize to what's called the Edison II, which is a car. It was the progressive automotive X Prize. $5 million, a small 700-pound car, that's about 300 kilos, four-seater, 100 miles to the gallon, completely reconceptualized what, or not, what a car is, it has to be. And by the way, the prize was given 100 miles to the gallon, four-seater, scalable manufacturing, and safe. These guys won it. It's a car, it's a beautiful little car. It takes eight pounds of pressure to move it. That means you can sort of lean on it like that, and it moves. The person who led the 30-person team for three years is a real estate developer. <laughs> a real, he loved cars, but he's a real estate developer. You did not, Abby Shaw was not a lawyer. I will end, but because I have more chances, this is not going to be the end. <laughs> Inherent in the process of entrepreneurship is some element that is contrary. That is inherent. Innovation isn't, but doing something that at some level goes against, defies conventional wisdom, whatever that is, is inherent in the process. It's the job of the, of the entrepreneur to look for opportunity that other people think is worthless, impossible, or stupid, when everyone is saying, look right, the entrepreneur says, wait a second, maybe I should look left. When everyone is saying, web 2.0, or clean tech, or whatever, the job of the entrepreneurship may be to look at staging 250 kilometer grueling, blister producing events. Turning worm poop into gold is worthless. Turning a hub where you have to fly packages into Atlanta in order to get them from New York to Boston, <laughs> that's stupid. That's called FedEx. <laughs> <laughs> Building a video pill that only Jules Verne could have imagined before that that's impossible. 
So it's fundamental in the process of entrepreneurship to do things that are worthless, impossible, or stupid. For the policymakers, I don't know why I'm pointing over here. For the policymakers, that suggests something that's very important and explains why cluster strategies do not work. Period. Every country in the world has a cluster strategy. Most big cities in the world have a cluster strategy. There is no evidence that a top-down cluster strategy creates entrepreneurship. There is, to foreshadow something I'll talk about tomorrow, lots of evidence, lots of evidence that entrepreneurship creates clusters. It's entrepreneurship. It's not innovation. It's entrepreneurship. It's not competitiveness. It's entrepreneurship. It's not clusters. And it's a scarce and valuable resource in society. And from a personal point of view, and I can explain why, but from a personal point of view, it's also a lot of fun. But I warn you, it's also highly addictive, <laughs> highly addictive, and those of you who know entrepreneurs, stay away from them, because not only is it highly addictive, but those of us who have done it like to get other people addicted as well. So not only don't you need to be an expert, you don't need to be innovative, by the way, you don't even need to be passionate, but it's also unhealthy. <laughs> but entrepreneurship is in fact well established at one, some people say the, I don't believe it's the, one of the key drivers of quality of life, innovation in society, and wealth. It certainly is one of them. There's a lot of evidence for that. And it's an idea, like Victor Hugo <coughs> once said, that there's nothing as powerful, no army is powerful as an idea whose time has come. I think entrepreneurship there's nothing as powerful right now as entrepreneurship, and I congratulate all of you for investing so much time and resources and energy in order to try and promote more of it here. So that's the end of my formal comments. And